Here comes the sun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's not bad, eh? My pronouns are he, him. I study physics. Are viruses alive? Last week we talked about our evolution over the past 500 million years. This week, week four, our evolution over the past three billion years. So this is six times deeper into the past. And uh, anything surprising? I think the most surprising thing that made a lot of sense was that prokaryotes live, or like the mitochondria, for example, is a prokaryote that lives inside a eukaryotic cell. Mm -hmm. that well, it kind of makes it a eukaryotic cell because mm. it lives inside of it, mm. right? I think that's another way to say it. it there was a prokaryote and a bacteria, and they went like this, and then it be that was the origin of, of eukaryotes. Yeah. So the, that fact made everything made a, make a bit more sense, but it was also very surprising in the same way. And you should also know that Lynn Margulis, a female biologist, was the one who essentially was the queen of eukaryotes. She loves eukaryotes. Yeah, that was and, very cool. And uh, <laughs> she was the one who promoted this, and it was really against the grain. Everybody said, you're crazy, you're crazy. But she said, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. And then she prevailed, and now the entire universe, everybody, everybody who's a biologist says, yes, Lynn was right. Yeah, I love when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I do too. <laughs> um, coanflagellates, the Volvox, I didn't... Coanflagellates? Yes, I think I just didn't understand it as much. Uh, that sort of thing, and I thought it was it was interesting the zero dimensional versus two three dimensional life, mm -hmm. but I didn't completely understand that or like right. the complete point. Well, I guess I was trying to yeah. see the coanflagellates are the earliest metazoans. So when you say I'm an animal, the fancy word for that is metazoan. Matter of fact, you asked what opisthokonts were. Yes. And opisthokonts are animals or metazoans plus fungi. Mm. What distinction is it like being Aware is that or plants are aware? So what? No, 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 no. So, so if if you have eukaryotes, right, mm -hmm. and then you have things that go towards plants because they have these chloroplasts in them, right, and then there are other things that don't have chloroplasts, but everybody has a mitochondria, and then this was a, this was one point six billion years ago about. Then one point two billion years ago there was a split. This one led to metazoa, and this one led to fungi. Right. right. So this group together is called opisthokonts. Uh, and the difference is that one has. The plants have chloroplasts yes, and yes, the others don't. Yes. Okay. Fungi are heterotrophs. We are animals are heterotrophs. That means we eat other things. Oh, plants right. are phototrophs. That means they eat light. Right? What about Venus flytraps? Well, they, um, they are phototrophs and heterotrophs. Okay. <laughs> so they sort of, is that the sort of hybridization they put? Made no, 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 no. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I doubt that their digestive enzymes have come and have a common ancestor with the digestive enzymes and you and me that we're using to digest our breakfast. Right, okay. Interesting. So that might have been like another origin of digestive enzymes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think so. I'd have to look into that. I don't, I haven't thought about that, but yes, I think you're right. You mentioned again offhand, like you just mentioned these sort of amazing things and then go on. But uh, yeah, there was, because we talked about uh, uh, secondary and um, endosymbiosis where mm -hmm. you engulf another thing, but then there was another example of tertiary. The idea is, well, so you have some amoeba-like thing and it come, the mitochondria goes inside, right? And then that thing can also take in a, an alpha proteobacteria. Alpha proteobacteria is the bacteria of the mitochondria. Then you have cyanobacterium gets engulfed in there. So you have two mm -hmm. organelles inside a eukaryotic cell, but that's a, going to be a plant. But if you don't have the, uh, the chloroplasts, if you don't have the uh, cyanobacteria. Well, this thing, and then let's suppose there's this one with a uh, mitochondria and cyanobacteria, and then this thing engulfs that. Mm. So this one has mitochondria and chloroplasts. This one has mitochondria only, and it goes like this. So we have endosymbiosis between two already organelles, and then inside of this one, and then the tertiary one is something engulfs that thing. Oh, so it's like a plant animal plant. Well, no, oh, because plants, animals are something that oh, applies to, meta, to yeah. multicellular things, and these are single-cell things we're talking about. Oh, right. That's, uh, but what do, they, what do they look like? Well, uh, you should ask Ayak in that, because he's an expert cool. <laughs> in algae, and, and what basically brown, you look into brown algae. Brown algae and oh. red algae are the ones where I think you have the highest diversity of this inside of this inside of this. And it can really get complicated, like all oh, life. <laughs> So Riley, what did you think of week four? Honestly, I, I liked week four. You like is it your best week so far? Well <laughs> your favorite week? Probably. 
Mm. Why? Because, again, we're going more basal. We're discussing things that are... Three billion. Yeah. Not we're... just 500 million. Now. And for someone who's used to reading books about... I don't want to say animals, but... Post-Cambrian... To... Yeah. Post-Cambrian yeah. trivia. That sort of thing. <laughs> The content seems to be becoming more and more relevant for astrobiology. We're getting deeper and deeper, of course, yeah. as you get closer to the source. Okay. Deep dive it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what did you find? What did you find the most interesting? I'll take a look through the list of. All right. All right. I never knew just how deep this rabbit hole of endosymbiosis goes. Ah, good. Because I knew about mitochondria. I knew about your organelles. Mm -hmm. I knew about chloroplasts, and I thought, yeah, that's like three instances, you're telling me that there's secondary and tertiary and tertiary. It's just, I, I had no idea it was such a big deal. Well, yeah, it, it's interesting because it's very controversial. It very, it goes against this idea of a diverging tree, right? Yeah. You have diverging, diverge, and everything gets different. Yeah. But wait a minute, then they come together and then one's inside of another and then one's on top of another. And that <laughs> life seems to do almost anything you can imagine. And so, there's a big debate about whether endosymbiosis is an important part of evolution. And matter of fact, there was some Oxford debate between Richard Dawkins and, and uh, Lynn Margulis. And Lynn was saying, oh. this is the most important thing about evolution. <laughs> about evolution. And Dawkins said, no, 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 divergence endosymbiosis is kind of like a one-off deal that it doesn't affect evolution that much. Or uh, it, that's what he would say, I think. The other thing I was going to say about was the paramecium. I never mm. knew they had so many... Sexes, for lack of a better word. Yeah, well, micronuclei and macronuclei. Yeah. And it's the, it's really that cool. was the origin of the somatic germline distinction. Right. So what do you think of that? I, I'll be honest, I had heard about it with other things, but never with... Uh, I'd never thought about it in terms of being a human and having mm -hmm. somatic and germ cells. Mm -hmm. That just, yeah, kind of... Uh, Took me a minute to stare at the wall. And well, when you have a child, then you see, oh, there are my germ cells. They're yeah. going to live forever, and I, me, I'm going to die. And all the other is just to make the other mm -hmm. work. I insert my own opinions and interpretations into this thing. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of inevitable. Right, right, especially <laughs> with me. But uh, <laughs> did you say, oh, wait a minute, Charlie, what were you most skeptical about? Did you wince at anything? I said, oh, I don't know if that's right. Charlie, are you sure about that? I kind of... With the the Jochen one is always oh with always the... entertaining between <laughs> you two, but I kind of I wish you two could agree to disagree on some uh, no just compromise on part of this because on one hand you're right you've got these traits that have evolved in multiple organisms from a common ancestor and the traits of the common ancestor almost certainly could contribute to the evolution of those traits. So it's not independent. It's almost certainly. I would say certainly. Though, well, it? again, but you also want to consider your external factors and whether it's being forced to happen through other means. That's the debate. Yeah. And I just think the debate has been <laughs> skewed so much towards completely independent. Yeah. And I'm just saying fair. completely dependent. Well, I... Can I can I meet someone in the middle here? I, I... Well, you can, but I can't. I've already <laughs> committed myself to the opposite path. Deep homology. Deep homology. God, I, I feel like I'm in a cult now. How similar do prokaryotes need to be in order to exchange genetic material? So, you know, I don't think I don't think anybody knows the answer to that because I. That's pretty cool. I, I, they're they're living in a community. One of the coolest things about this is that you have a bacteria and another bacteria, different species or strain. And then they ha this one has some plastids that can, not plastids, plasmids that can help it deal with the problem. And then this one says, oh, I can't, I can't, give me some of your plasmids. So they exchange these plasmids, and then all of a sudden this strain can now do the same thing that this strain could do. Now, when you're asking the question, who has more genes, the humans or this bacterium, yeah. do you include this gigantic library that this bacterium has because it has access to all the other plasmids in any but prokaryote that can exchange with it. That's a pretty cool question. I, and I, so, and so, like but that. when comparisons are made, mm -hmm. they're always saying, oh no, we're not going to include all this stuff that it has access to. Yeah. We're only going to include the one that's inside of it already. And that's, I said, well, that's not fair. Yeah. But, and so that's an interesting thing about comparing apples with oranges and to make humans look better because we have 20,000 genes and you only have 5,000. But <laughs> okay. actually it has access to, let's say, 200 million or something. Yeah, that's, that, 
that's another angle I hadn't thought about. I, okay. Uh, the last thing I want to say about is with the whole endosymbiosis, and you hear about you've got prokaryotes living inside eukaryotes, and you think, well, that's... But wait, wait, formerly free-living prokaryotes okay. that became endosymbiotically incorporated, and when they do that, they are no longer prokaryotes because they're organelles, right? And that's so they fair. lose some of their DNA, they lose their ability to be free-living, and so they're not really prokaryotes living inside of their common their ancestors were prokaryotes that's but they're no yeah, longer i'll buy that so murray our evolution over the past three billion years three billion is a big number mm -hmm. so what do you think a week uh, what is this week four yeah um you are going into this trying to inspire people to i am learn more. how'd it work uh, this this week was the most effective for me so far i think um this is the most interested I've been in biology since like Greg Mendel in like year eight science. So you like this week because you learned a lot of basic biology? Basically, yeah, yeah. Com I, coming into this, I knew the, there was a split between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but perhaps the, the, the specifics of endosymbiosis, something that really fascinated me and that I think you explained quite well, at least for me. Um, but it does, it did bring up this question for me you haven't made this point as much as I think others have, but in my experience, looking at this question of are we alone, mm -hmm. a lot of people cite how long... So I was listening to John Green in a podcast. Do you know John Green? Uh, he's yes, a, yes, He's yes. an author. Yeah. He, Wait, he, he's the guy who makes podcasts for high school students. Uh, Crash Course, yes. That's and him. his brother. And his brother, yeah. yeah, John, yeah. Uh, so John Green is like the history one. He's an author. Mm -hmm. But he also, he makes... I think you'd hate this. He makes a podcast called The Anthropocene Reviewed, mm -hmm. where he reviews human society. I don't, I don't hate it. He's just talking to high school students, and I'm... Well, and it's I, not just for high school it students. It seems to me that it is, but... Okay. <laughs> Charlie's level. <laughs> that's right. Well, you, well, come on. The guy is, is... That's where the audience is. Who do you think watches those things? But Anthropocene Review, he's aimed at... This is not relevant. I'll okay. send you a link okay. to it. Okay. it. It's aimed at adults. But, um... So, he... he Come, he, he argues that the time elapsed between earth forming mm -hmm. and the start of life mm -hmm. is shorter than mm -hmm. that between the, the, the time it took for prokaryotes to evolve and for eukaryotes, between the evolution of eukaryotes and prokaryotes. I'm, and, not, I'm not sure I understand what you just okay, said. So I, I wrote a paper on this particular topic mm -hmm. because it's very mm -hmm. important, mm -hmm. but... If life first evolved, when we say life, we don't know what we mean, but let's yeah. say it was at 4 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. And then we get eukaryotes about 2 billion years ago, so 2 yeah. billion years. Yeah. So your idea and is Earth that formed this half a billion, billion. Yeah. Ver yeah. is shorter than 2 billion yeah. years. Yeah, well, that's okay. his argument. Well, yes, it is. Yeah. What's the argument there? It's his it's argument it. is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of people point to the development of eukaryotes as like a, like a great filter in the Fermi paradox. Some people right? do. A, a potential, like big hill that it's hard to Some get over. Some people do, yes. And that's why our form of life on Earth is exceptional. Some people say yes. that, yes. But this, it seems like if if the early phylogenetic trees aren't so much trees as they are like knotted, knotted roots mm -hmm. with all this endosymbiosis happening, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that seems to me like it, it's much more likely for eukaryotes to develop out there, you know, and it's less of a hill. Well, that depends, like... The, thir the first thing that were the amoebas, that I think are some archaea-like amoeba that started, mm -hmm. it was a prokaryote, and it had a membrane that could help it evolve. That's how it, like, that's how it went hunting. It would yeah. engulf something and then eat it. And apparently, there was a selection pressure on what the thing it was eating to say, hey, I'm going to fight this. I have a thick membrane, and I can fight it. Mm -hmm. And so it got to engulf this thing, and then things stayed alive. And then they back and forth and back and forth, and then they started, okay, well, this is mutual beneficial, so mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. going to live together. Um, you could say that, it, and it happened again and again and again, but I think it happened again and again in the context of the membrane that had evolved that allowed this thing to en to envelop something and the context of a membrane that evolved to prevent that. Mm -hmm. So how specific is that? You know, I don't know, but if it happens again and again and again, but they're dependent on each other, they have a common ancestor, then all bets are off about whether we can extrapolate it to elsewhere. Okay. So I, that's why I would push back on the idea that Oh, endosymbiosis. It, it might be that endosymbiosis is something that we should expect elsewhere. So engulfing things uh, mm -hmm. is uh, something that might be the most fundamental part of evolution. Mm -hmm. But we don't. I don't think we have multiple independent examples of it. Mm -hmm. All the examples that I showed 
I think we're in a weird way, not a weird way, but a, a, as expected, they had a common ancestor which gave them the prerequisites to allow this to happen. And that pre, those prerequisites were species specific, mm -hmm. which means, you know, set of measure zero maybe. But would, would there really be any other way of for an equivalent micro, microbe on another planet to go hunting in that way? Like, how? it's kind of an impossible question because we have a sample size of one. Well, but, well wait a minute, but, but if it were something that was very readily done, we would expect bacteria today in this room to be mm -hmm. doing that. And mm -hmm. we don't see that okay. happening. Yeah. Well, eukaryotes could be, like, like life, you said, hey, if life started again, some little pond, then today the bacteria and other things would start eating it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't think that's the, necessarily the case of, hey, there's bacteria over there, one would try to do this, and then it would evolve a whole other set of eukaryotes, eukaryote two, for example. Mm -hmm. Additionally, the, like if, if we lived in a world where endosymbiosis is incredibly common and uh, like... Well, would... we do live in one that's okay, common. Yeah. The question is whether it's independent yeah. and common. Yeah. That, and that's a whole nother question. I actually struggle here to, to separate my biases of like, it would just be more interesting if they were, right? We would, we've, this, is, this goes back what to would the be more interesting? weeks. If they were multicellular. Oh, yes. Because yes, they're yes, more yeah. likely to be like us. Okay, so you, you know? want so you're just saying, hey, let's let's not use the science. The science is kind of vague, and so let's just to rely on my hopes. Almost. You know, okay. like we need we need a set we've got people searching mm -hmm. for them right now. Mm -hmm. Um it it's just we're we're going to have more luck if we refine actually I don't know what I'm saying. Let's go this looking for things take. we want to find. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that doesn't sound to me like the best kind of science because, no. matter of fact, people do that all the time and they do data analysis till they find what they want and then they stop and then they they find mistake after mistake after mistake until they find what they want and then there could be 10 other mistakes but they'll stop doing it mm -hmm. because they found what they want. Mm -hmm. That's that's really a dangerous way to do data analysis, I can tell you, and I've seen it many times. I. And, and you want to do, are we alone that way? I don't, well, it's not up to me, is it? You know? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe you will be involved in electro, you know, making a, the world's best at the radio telescope. I do have a question go, go, go. about senescence. And, and, and you suggested that uh, the senescence we see in, in humans, obviously it would have evolved much earlier, is sort of programmed. That's what I think is true. But so, again... But it's also the minority point of view yeah. among biologists. <laughs> Not just the physicists, the biologists think that's, you know, that we don't like that. I feel like uh, in, in today, if, when we're learning about aging or when we're studying aging, we're, we're constantly like looking at telomeres, right? Well, not all the time, but that's part of it. But yeah, that's, that's a lot of emphasis is placed on them. Yes. Um, and they degrade as DNA they copies. Get shorter, they, they get, get shorter. shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. And then once they're too short, they can't really prevent. It's called the Hayflick limit. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the, they take human cells and put them in a Petri dish and divide, divide, divide. They, co they divide about 40 times on round average, mm -hmm. and then they stop. So are you suggesting that this uh, shortening, this degradation, could have been an evolved feature, yes, and it's not a, exactly. a result of just chemistry? That's right. Okay. That's right. So I suppose why, why would there be an evolutionary benefit to for dying. killing off the yes. older ones, right? Mm -hmm. the, the wizened ones, the ones that, that know right. how to survive right. in the world. Or why would there be an evolutionary benefit to dying for an At individual? All. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that's the point that biologists bring up. And uh, because there's, and they're, what I think they're, the emphasis that is wrong is on individual selection. They think that selection, mm -hmm. natural selection, Darwinian evolution, relies on selection of individuals. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, there's, there's, but there's a giant debate between individual mm -hmm. selectionists like Richard Dawkins and, uh, and uh, David Sloan Wilson and people are group selectionists. Mm -hmm. And this has been a debate for about 50 years now. I'm a little bit on the group selectionist side. Mm -hmm. Did, you know, talk about the videos that I made. You, you noticed, I'm sure, that there's an intro and an outro, yeah. and then like a PowerPoint presentation in between. Yeah. How is that working? I like it. Yeah. 